Let's do a review of radiographic interpretation for dental decay. The de two primary modes of detection for caries is a clinical examination. Certainly we can see gross decay, but we also use an explorer. And the whole point of an explorer is to feel within pits and fissures and see if there's any tug back that might in indicate early decay that might lead into something more significant below the enamel surface. Radiographic exam is predominantly for this interproximal decay. That being said, we do use it for um, identifying root surface decay, recurrent decay around restorations, and to a certain degree with occlusal decay and buccal and lingual caries, but the pr predominant modes of identifying occlusal and facial lingual surfaces is through clinical exam. So interproximal caries just means between two teeth typically right at the contact or just below the contact point because that is a high risk area for plaque accumulation and even food particles um, if somebody's not appropriately brushing and flossing regularly. And typically this is shaped and described as a triangle in the enamel that points towards the, de the dentin, points towards the dental enamel junction. And then once the decay reaches the dentin, it extends laterally along that softer dentin substructure with a point towards the pulp. Incipient decay, by definition, is decay that extends less than halfway through the enamel. So we can look at this progression of decay, and this was from a research article done um, with the Dental Practice-Based Research Network, where the decay as we go from left to right obviously gets more severe. So this very first clinical example would be incipient decay, and this is the article this is, this is um, derived from. And it's interesting, this was an article where they actually surveyed clinicians, at what point would you restore the tooth? And the results were interesting, and they broke it down on into a low caries risk individual and a high caries risk individual in, individual and certainly our clinical decision making is not just based on what we're seeing on a radiograph but it's also based on the, the patient's dental history their oral care and other factors so it's more than just identifying our radiograph and saying we're going to restore it it also there's other factors involved the current thought is if decay is not cavitated it can potentially be remineralized but again our decision making may be different versus a a, a low caries risk individual and a high caries risk inter interval. So as we extend to the second clinical picture, you can see the decay has gone through the enamel, but we don't necessarily see any decay within the adentin. 39% of the clinicians said if this was a low caries risk individual, we would um, restore by this point. And actually it's 39 plus the 1.8 that would restore even the incipient decay. So it's a little over 40% versus in a high risk individual, 75% of people would have restored this tooth by this point. So there is a difference between that high and low caries risk. Certainly by the time the decay hits the dentin and starts running laterally, then we see the vast, vast majority of clinicians would and should restore this tooth at this point. As we go to those two clinical examples on the far right, those are so deep, those could might in, involve the pulp. Why do I say might? Because we know decay always goes further than it looks on a radiograph. There has to be significant uh, um, mineral product gone on from, from a, any structure, whether it's bone or tooth structure, before we can see, identify it on a radiograph. So decay is always going to go further. I would, I would sus suspect that that picture on the very right, that tooth, that will end up extending to the pulp, but maybe even that fourth case as well. So we're always smarter if we have a conversation with the patient before we even start excavating a decay to say this is a deep, this is deep decay, and there's a good chance that we're going to have to make a decision about a root canal or extraction if this extends to the pulp. If you wait and have a pulp exposure as you're ex ex excavating the decay, it feels to the patient more like you did something wrong versus you give them a heads up. So it's always a good idea to say, hey, this is super deep. We, we'll do whatever we can. I'll go nice and slow. I'll do whatever I can to keep this, keep you from needing a root canal. But if the decay, if this, this bacterial process goes all the way to the pulp, we know your pulp is inflamed and you'll need a root canal or extraction.
Occlusal decay runs a little different because the triangle starts at the point within a pit or fissure and extends laterally as it reaches towards the dental uh, enamel junction. And then once it hits the DEJ, it runs laterally again. Often we don't see that enamel triangle very well, but once it hits the dentin, it extends laterally. It's hard to see occlusal decay on a radiograph until it's very deep. So the, by, by the time we're seeing significant occlusal decay on a periapical or a bite wing radiograph, there's a good chance that could be into the pulp tissue by then. Again, we, if you have to kind of imagine these triangles as we go through this. But again, significant decay. There's a lot of missing tooth structure there. A little deeper and a little deeper. You know, and any of these three might be to the point where if we want to save the tooth, we would end up it be in a situation where a root canal would be indicated. Now, buccal and lingual facial lingual decay is difficult to detect on a radiograph. It's really best to detect clinically, and these are clinical scenarios where we can see it, uh, should be able to see it. If we can see it on a radiograph, sometimes it just presents as a small circular radiolucent area. Um, but again, uh, a dental radiograph is not the best way to detect these carious lesions. Root surface decay is certainly a, a, a significant problem in especially our, our geriatric population with xerostomia because it makes, we know cervical decay is where we see xerostomia related decay. And it tends to be this cupped out or crater shaped radiolucency. We certainly need to rule out burnout when we're evaluating this. But here we can see this cup-shaped radiolucency. Different than burnout, we'll talk, talk about burnout next. So here's somebody with significant root surface decay. We can see it on the mesial of number 30, I mean 31, the mesial and distal of 30, the, the mesial and distal of 29, and maybe the distal of 28, it's a little hard to tell on, on this radiograph. Certainly, if we see this on a, on a radiograph, we would attempt to feel this with our Explorer, but often the proximal contacts are such we cannot get an Explorer in there to feel it, and we have to rely on our radiographs for our interpretation. Cervical burnout is interesting because it's this radiolucent band that occurs at the cervical region that is not decay. Um, this is where x-rays over-penetrate or burn out the thinner edges of the tooth. If you think about a tooth, it has more bulk towards the center, and as you go out towards the periphery, just with the curvature of a tooth, there is less tooth structure. And so this tends to be more pronounced at the proximal edges. And one way to dif differentiate root surface decay from cervical burnout is this does not extend underneath the enamel and stops at the crestal bone. So this is this radiolucent area that's between the enamel and the crustal bone. And in fact, if we look at this radiograph, there's burnout in multiple places along this. So the difficulty sometimes is whether this is root surface decay or not. And often in, as the uh, um, contacts are tighter or, or you know, more, more superior, as we go towards the crustal bone, the contacts are a little more open and we're going to get an explorer in there. If we can feel a cavitation, it might be root surface decay, but we have to rely, often we can't get our explorer in there, so we have to rely on our, our radiographic exam to decide if intervention is necessary. So let's just look at a couple cases. So, you know, I always look at decay like I brush my teeth or floss my teeth. You know, I start in the upper right, go over to the upper, you know, start at number two, go over number 15, drop down to number 18 and come over to 31. So if we look at this bite wing and it's a, it's a pretty good quality of bite wing. We've got pretty good um, interproximal um, viewing here. Um, so if we start on number 11, it looks like there is a carious lesion, because there is. I would, I would throw this into the incipient decay category and likely not restore it. Now, there's some exceptions here. Super high rate carries individual. Here we see somebody that's relatively young. They have lots of interproximal lesions. And if they're in a situation that they may not, we think they may not be coming back to a dentist anytime soon, is a different scenario than somebody that's going to be a, a regular um, seeker of dental care that maybe we can watch a lesion. But if we think this is somebody that's going to, we're going to lose to follow up or we're not going to see them for two or three years, all of a sudden we might be more aggressive with these. Here we see decay that I think is now, 
we're seeing a little radiolucency within the dentin. I think this is beyond the incipient decay part because it is now involving the dentin, so this wouldn't need intervention. A little more pronounced on the distal of number 12. We can see it on the mesial of 13 and the distal of 13, and it's really hard to, to identify decay on the mesial or of number 14 or the distal even the distal of number 13 to agree, but I think we've got enough good enough view. I can't tell if there's an incipient decay on 14 because we have this interproximal overlap. We have this horizontal overlap. And that's why we take a more anterior bite wing, which this is. And how do I know that? Because we've caught the canines on this versus we're going to take another bite wing a little further back where the molar is going to be. The first molar is going to be in the center of, of, the, of the film and our cone head is going to be opened up a little bit more so we can try to get those interproximal um, areas um, on the mesial distal of the first molar and not have this horizontal overlap. If we drop down to the mandible, it looks like there, there's, there is incipient decay on the mesial of 19 and probably a beyond that on the distal of 20. Again, incipient decay, likely incipient decay, little more pronounced on the mesial of 29 I mean, I mean I'm sorry on the mesial of 21 on the distal of 22. Now do we see cervical burnout on here? A couple places we can often see cervical burnout is the the maxillary first premolar because it has an accentuated mesial and distal concavity so we can see this kind of radiolucent area that stops at the crustal bone and stops at the enamel. That is not root surface decay, that is cervical burnout. Let's drop down and look at number 20 on the distal of number 20. You see how it's more prominent at the proximal area, but we do see an area that's a little radiolucent. You know, we see an, a very prominent area on the distal of number 22. And look at that. And again, it stops at the enamel, stops at the bone. That is cervical burnout. That is not decay. So let's look at a full series of four bite wings as we go, go through this. And again, if we're going to start at number two, it's difficult to, to distinguish the mesial of number two and the distal of number three. But we certainly can see that the mesial of number three, there's decay. On the distal of number four, there's decay. Now, if we jump to the more anterior bite wing, this just gives us extra confirmation that there's decay that's in the enamel that is extended to the dent, and we can see those those triangles um, that we reviewed earlier. So you've got two good views here, and you might have a periapical as well. While the bite wing is the most ideal radiograph to evaluate decay, sometimes the periapical can help help as well. Obviously, severe severe decay on the mesial of number five. If we continue over the maxilla. There we can see decay on the mesial of number 14. The distal of number 14 is, is overlapped on that film, but we see it well in the next film, which gives us an indication that, um, that decay on the mesial of number 14 is actually indeed true. The other advantage we have here, since number 13 is missing, we're going to be able to look directly and with clinical vision and with our explorer, we're going to be able to tell if that's truly decay. Incipient decay next to an edentulous area is the most ideal situation for remineralization because we can get our stuff to it. There's no tooth in the way. So sometimes if there's interproximal decay and a tooth ends up being extracted, like number 13 in this case, all of a sudden that decay on number 14 will become arrested because not only can we get fluoride and other products on the tooth, but even having saliva that can now reach that area, it's self-cleansing now it may um, resolve. If we drop down to the mandible when we swing over, certainly on the distal of 19, there's significant decay, which we can see on both um, radiographs. As we continue over to the right side of the mandible, on the distal of number 28, the mesial of 29, the distal of 29, the distal of number 30, and then there's huge decay on the mesial of 31. And it's difficult to tell on this, but I think from looking, and again, if we go to the second peri, um, second bite wing, we can see confirmation of this. The one on 31 does, I can't tell that there's any break in, in the interproximal area. So this could represent occlusal decay. The same on number 32. That might um, 
that might represent a clues of decay that it's just on the mesial aspect and we would be able to tell that better clinically and finally recurrent decay that's just decay that occurs next to a pre-existing restoration it could be a, a composite an amalgam a crown whatever often at the interproximal margin and you know our goal when we replace two structure is to have this this continuity from two structure to restoration that's just perfect but we can never be as perfect as original tooth so it just makes an area that that tends to be a plaque trap and folks have to be very careful about um, brushing and flossing properly when especially when they have interproximal um, restorations you know many of our patients feel like once they have a crown they don't have to worry about decay ever it's it's the exact opposite you actually are more prone to decay because you don't have no longer have this perfect margin so if we look at this bite wing first, there's there's recurrent decay, certainly around the second um, premolar. But if you look at the first premolar, there is as well. Now let's let's look at this periapical. We said sometimes a periapical can give us another view, and look at that. It shows up very well in the the periapical as well as the bite wing. So if we look at this picture on the right, lots of decay around that crown margin. But if even if we go to that second premolar. There's recurrent decay around that distal margin as well. Mesial margin, I'm not as sure about because that might represent cervical burnout because it looks like it stops at the crustal bone. If we look at the distal of that second premolar, it doesn't extend all the way to the crustal bone, so that represents recurrent decay, which is different than an unseated crown margin or an imperfect laboratory fabricated crown margin. This is so much a regular, this is just a this was just a, a gap in the crown margin when it was cemented. Now, does this need to be replaced? Maybe, but maybe not. What if that patient got that crown 30 years ago and there's been no decay occur in 30 years? That would kind of indicate to me that the patient is, that's a super low risk site, even though there's an open margin for the patient to have any problems. The other scenario we deal with is sometimes a, a patient might have gotten that crown three months ago and all, all of a sudden they're in your office and when you say oh you need this crown replaced they bristle because they say how could i need this crown replaced it's brand new are you just trying to replace unnecessary you know unnecessarily replace this crown and we have to educate our patients and do it in a tactful way where we're also not attacking our colleagues so just one last radiograph to kind of wrap things up to look at this just look at it at this bite wing again if we start on the upper right there's not decay here but look at that crown margin and calculus associated with this um, poor ad adaptation of this amalgam to the two surface also puts a, a, a super high risk for um, recurrent decay if we extend to the mesial of the premolar look at that this huge chunk of amalgam that that got underneath the wedge and didn't get removed and there's associated bone loss with it but look at the recurrent decay on the mandibular second premolar this box was probably not extended far enough gingivally and it and it put this margin in at risk for recurrent decay and we see this extensive decay on both the mesial and the distal of the molar so lots of work that needs to be done on the on on this for this patient so if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, happy studying. Thank you. Bye.